that. Um, a few announcements before we begin. Uh, first off, we're so glad to see our brother and sister and their beautiful daughter from Tennessee down visiting with us. It's uh, uh, always a pleasure to have them here with us. Uh, you know, uh, they are family in more ways than one, and we uh, definitely appreciate having them here. Uh, so, uh, again, we have Brother John Boyd and his family here with us this morning, covering for Mark. Uh, update on Mark is uh, they have been putting Mark through the mill. Uh, stretching him to points that he ain't never been stretched before, so he ain't feeling too good. <laughs> he is uh, giving him a little problems. We continue to pray and hope for his full recovery with, from his surgery. And that, and that, so keep him in thought and prayer. You know, uh, we want to keep in thought and prayer all our shut-ins. You know, uh, I mean, you know, it's the things that are going on today with this virus and that and everything, and people are locked up and that and everything, afraid to get out into society and this and that. Let's keep them in thought and in prayer and that. So uh, we have, uh, again, we, we were so glad to introduce our new brother in Christ, Philip Lopez, Jr. Uh, if you will notice in the bulletin that his phone number is in, now in the bulletin. We are so glad to have him here with us, you know. Yeah. We continue to pray that everyone be safe at this time. You know, we have so much, again, so much sickness going on and things with other things that uh, we as Christians know should not be going on and that, uh, and that we, we pray that these things will be corrected and that and everything. Uh, and that the, uh, the next update for the phases will be coming out this coming Friday. Now, when will they make the decision of if we're going into phase three or not? May not be until the following week. So as of right now, next Sunday will be our last one hour service, okay? So hopefully that is what, and then the following Sunday we'll be going back to full services. Bible study in the morning, Sunday evening services, and Wednesday night sir, uh, Bible study. So let's hope and pray that that's how it works out and that we can get back into a, a full schedule in our services to the Lord and that everything. Uh, we would like to, at this time, wish uh, we have some upcoming birthdays this month and that and everything. Uh, and they'll be later in the month. We uh, want to keep that in thought. Uh, for the, those of y'all who don't know, this past Wednesday, me and Melissa celebrated our 31st wedding anniversary. <laughs> 31 years. Uh, I hear somebody saying, be careful. <laughs> you know, 31 years. You know what? Today, that's an accomplishment in the, to this world today. Scott? As an accomplishment, you know, that's so, and that, and if you enter into marriage thinking it's all going to be a bed of roses, you better wake up because there's going to be ups and downs, and that, you know, it just, it's going, it can be, have good times and bad times, but it's how you work it out together, and that's so. We have Brother Scott is going to be leading us in song this morning, and I do not have your first number. Uh, five, 529. 529. Five twenty nine. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but fully lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
all of the ground is sinking sand. His Put me in the <laughs> so gives way he open stay on Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand all of the ground is sinking sand. Number 571. <coughs> 571. Which, uh, singing and allergy season don't go together. They just don't go together. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sin from the Father and it thrills my soul just to feel and to His grace reaches me and will last in eternity. Now I'm under His control and I'm happy in my soul just to know that He And brighter than the sun It was offered at Calvary For everyone Greatest of treasures And it's today Though my sin we let her open. Can y'all hear me? Yes, you can. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. <laughs> dear merciful Father, everlasting God, we are so blessed, dear God, we are so thankful that we have another opportunity whereby we can come out and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we've been missing a lot of things that we should be doing as a congregation. We've been missing visitations and things of that sort. But, Father, we know that you understand the things how they are at this time. And we know, dear God, you'll make them better. We pray that you will be with each and every one who's here. We pray, Heavenly Father, we've all come with the same reason, for the same purpose, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray for the one who will bring forth the lesson this morning, dear God, that the things he has on his mind, and we pray, dear God, that those things we can apply to our lives, that we may be better workers in your kingdom. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the churches of Christ throughout this land and country. 
Pray, Heavenly Father, they too are striving and finding ways that we can come together and worship you as we should. Once again, we ask that you continue to bless us, give us those things, Heavenly Father, that we need. Build us up, we pray, where we are torn down, but Father, tear us down when we do those things that are contrary to your word. We ask these prayers and many, many others in his name, your beloved son Jesus. May we all say amen. Number 100. Number 100. Let's sing this song before we gather around the table this morning and partake of the Lord's Supper. When we meet in sweet communion, where the feast divine is spread, hearts are brought in. Closer union while partaking of the bread. Precious feast, all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers. Do this in my memory. God so loved what wondrous measure, loved and gave the best of heaven, bought us with that matchless treasure. For us his life was given, precious feast, all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, do this. In my memory, feast divine, all hell surpassing, precious blood for you and me, while we sup, Christ gently whispers to this end. Memory, precious feast, all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers to this end. Do this in my memory. That's what God wants us to do as Christians. Because we know one day that Christ is going to come and bring us all home again with him in heaven. And we look forward to that day. But there was a price paid, and that was him on the cross for sins that he did not commit. And let us give thanks for God for sending his son. Let's bow. Father God in heaven, we are so thankful, Father, to you. Thanking you, Father, for Jesus and his, the perfect <coughs> sacrifice, Father. Jesus on the cross, Father. We pray, our Lord, that we as Christians, Father, be focused and not let his death 
be in vain in our lives as we remember, Father, this every first day of the week. In Jesus' name, amen. continue in prayer. Our God, our Father in heaven, holy and righteous is your name. Father, we come before that throne of grace and mercy and we think about Jesus at this time. Father, we think about how much you loved us that while we were still sinners, you would send your son. Father, that he would come and be that perfect sacrifice for us. Father, that he would give of himself when he didn't have to. Father, that he would shed his blood when he did not have to. Father, we know that it's not without the shedding of blood that we're forgiven. Father, we know that that was necessary. And Father, while we're sorry that he had to go through that and endure that pain, that suffering, Father, how thankful we are that he took what was rightfully ours, Father, the, the punishment that sin required. Father, may we remember that it is his blood that cleanses us as we partake of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Mark your books to number 465. Number 465 will be our song of invitation. And then turn to number 162. One hundred sixty two. God sent his son, they called him. some time on an introduction last time, so I'm not going to introduce myself as much, but there are a few things I want to say uh, before I get started. And uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's interesting all the connections uh, that you make in the, in the Lord's Church. I know that uh, uh, about two weeks ago, my uh, sister, Rose, uh, told me to watch out for uh, her friends here, and I see them sitting there, and I guess y'all were sitting next to each other at a wedding uh, just recently, and so I'm John, I'm 
I'm Rose's brother. Nice to meet y'all. And uh, that's about as socially distanced uh, welcome or, or greeting as you can get right there. Um, and then also, uh, I noticed on your back bulletin board, uh, you have uh, a couple of postcards from Lance Mosier and his wife. And uh, uh, they were actually at our wedding. Uh, now, before you get too excited, um, we actually paid them to be there. Uh, <laughs> they, they were our, uh, our photographers there. But beyond that, we also went to church together while we were at Freed Hardeman uh, a lot uh, at the Finger Church of Christ. Uh, down there uh, close to Henderson, so or up there, I guess, from here. Um, but it's, it's, it's neat. Uh, before my wife and I had been married for eight years, we'd lived in, in five different states, and uh, in every congregation we went to, we had a pretty strong connection to somebody that we had met earlier in our life. And uh, five different states. And then growing up, uh, I moved a lot. I, I think I moved seven times uh, when I was living with my parents. And, uh, and everywhere we'd go, there'd be some strong connection we had. And uh, it's just one of those neat things about being part of uh, the Lord's Church, where you have those connections. Seems like no matter where you go. And uh, just long for the day when, uh, when we're in eternity and we can see all those connections and and I, I pray that, that we'll be able to talk about uh, some of that and, and reminisce about some of our, our, our earthly connections uh, as we spend eternity uh, honoring our Father. But as we get into our lesson, uh, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the stories in the Bible, a lot of uh, the teachings of Jesus and, and a lot of what the prophets used to say uh, were, were illustrations based off of things that people would be used to seeing. Uh, they talk about shepherds, or they would talk about, uh, uh, you know, losing a coin, losing money. I know we've all, all done that, and that was an extreme example. Uh, they'd talk about uh, different, different types of battles and stuff like that. And, and it was all things that people were very familiar with, uh, because that was how to get the spiritual point across. And so one of those things we're going to talk about, or really focus a lot on this morning, is around clay and pottery. Now, we all know what, uh, what clay is. Uh, most of us probably played with some kind of clay uh, as a kid. I know we've been doing a lot of uh, gardening, and uh, we've been coming across a lot of clay in the ground, different kind of clay. That's the unrefined clay. Uh, and then pottery. Uh, many of us have ornamental pottery. Some of us use some of our pottery uh, for cooking or for putting, putting flowers in. And Pottery is one of those things that, that would have been very well known to the people that lived in the Bible times because they depended on it. There were lamps that were made out of pottery and, and their means of, of carrying water to their homes was in pottery. And then uh, we know from, from archeological records that, that there was decorative pottery. And so pottery would have been one of those things that, that everybody would have been able to easily identify with. And one example of this is found in Jeremiah 18 verses one through six. I'm going to read that. That's Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so ye are in my hand, O house of Israel. And so what I want us to kind of focus on is that, that workplace, or, or really that home sometimes, because sometimes they were one and the same, of that potter. I want us to try and, try and imagine what that would have looked like then. What, a, what the home or workplace of a potter would have looked like. And so, so again, I, I spoke of water and having to get water. Those of you that, uh, that are used to or, or have ever used a, a potter's wheel uh, know the importance of having water handy. Uh, water is how you help manipulate that, uh, that clay while it's on the potter's wheel. And so there probably would have been a large, uh, large basin of water 
so that as that, that potter, as, as the clay dries out as you handle it, he could add more to it, wet his hands, add it to the pottery itself. But not too much. If you add too much, that pottery can get kind of hard to control and just fly apart. But we would have seen that. Around the potter's wheel, there probably would have been different tools that he would use. Uh, again, there, there's different cutting tools that you use as that pottery spins around. Even if you don't have experience with it, you've probably seen a, a video at some point of pottery being made on a wheel. Uh, different tools to, to help you make indentions or designs in that pottery. And then you'd also, uh, somewhere would be a large baking oven. Because once you're done with that pottery on the wheel, you need to put it in the fire. And, and that, that baking oven serves a few purposes. Um, it, but really the main thing is it hardens that clay to make it usable. It turns it into a usable vessel. Again, if you had just raw pottery that hadn't been uh, fired in the clay in, or uh, fire, uh, warmed up in the fire and, and tried to add water to it, uh, you might get a, a nasty drink out of it, right? Some of that would start to deteriorate in there. And I'll tell you, uh, one of my favorite parts of middle school, uh, which I didn't like much in middle school, <laughs> but one of my favorite parts of middle school was an art class that I was in that was taught by my best friend's dad at the time. And so it was, a, it was an art class, and I loved going to it, not because of the paintings we got to do, but because we had a potter's wheel. And I would love to make those creations on the potter's wheel, and, and I'd love to, to bring them home to my mom and, and see her reaction, no matter how, I've seen some of it now, no matter how ugly some of it was. Uh, but to see the reaction of my mom and how, how excited she was for me to bring her something that, you know, at times I would have to explain to her what it was. Um, but my favorite part of the class was when we got to put our creations in that baking oven, in that kiln. And at the end of the class, we, we'd put our creations in there, and then the teacher would close the big lid, and then we'd come in the next day or over the weekend, and we'd come into the room, and it, again, towards the end of the day, he'd open up that kiln, and it had been off a while, and the room would fill with heat. And as he'd reach down into that kiln, he'd take out that pot, somebody made for their mom. Or he'd take out that, that little candle holder or, or maybe a little car that somebody made. But then it, as he started getting to the bottom, you'd, you'd hear some clanking around and he'd come up and it'd just be busted pieces of clay. And he'd lay it out and that was just part of it. Sometimes the clay would, would have little imperfections in it, little air pockets or, or things that weren't worked out when the clay was being made and and those things would expand under that extreme heat, and they would break. So not only did that, that kiln serve as a, a way to make the pottery usable, but that fire tested the pottery. That fire made sure that that pottery was going to survive whatever its job was, right? Because if there was a small imperfection in it, it would cause a weakness. But that fire, I, I don't know how hot it got. I never asked, all right? If I did, I don't remember. But... Uh, I know he had to use gloves hours after he would turn that thing off because it was still so hot. But that fire would work out the imperfections. And, uh, and, and if it was not able to be, uh, if it was not able to survive that, it was unusable. <clears throat> attached, to the, attached to the main room, there would have been probably some display rooms. Obviously, there would have been the workspace, and then there would have been the area where, where the items were displayed to be sold. Uh, and, and probably, I picture these rooms full of shelves uh, and, and full of all different kinds of pottery, probably organized by purpose. There would have been some very, uh, uh, very beautiful pieces, I'm sure. And then there probably would have been some very useful pieces that weren't so beautiful. And there probably would have been a mixture somewhere a, a very usable beautiful pieces that were probably very very expensive and precious uh, and then somewhere again there would probably be probably not in that room but maybe off in a corner somewhere there would be the discarded broken pieces that didn't survive the kiln now that we've uh, we've kind of looked at the potter's house his workspace let's think about the potter himself Trades in, in those times were often passed down from, from father to son and then 
that that father's grandson, and, and it would just kind of stay in the family. Oftentimes, if your uh, if your father was a a carpenter, uh, that's that's what you grew up learning. So that would be the trade. So from a very young age, most likely that potter would have learned how to work with this clay. And so uh, I, I imagine this this potter in the times being a master at his craft, uh, knowing exactly. Uh, every inch of that clay, knowing exactly what needs to be done, knowing what clay to, to use to do what with, and, and, and just uh, being the, the subject matter expert, as we say a lot today, on pottery. Uh, again, if, but if the pottery breaks, there's only so much he can do, right? Um, once it's already been fired, uh, it, it, it does have to be discarded. Now I'm I'm sure they had some way to reuse it. They may have ground it back up, turned it into different clay. But, um, but once that, that pottery would break, it's not like he had time to, to spend his time uh, trying to piece all those little pieces together. It was an unworthy vessel. All right, now that we have this picture of the potter and his workspace and his tools, let's try to think of a, uh, a spiritual lesson here. First of all, man is the clay. Isaiah 54, 8. Uh, Isaiah uses uh, clay to kind of describe the relationship between our, our Heavenly Father uh, and us. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter. We are all the work of thy hands. So again, God our Father is our potter. And, uh, and we are the work of his hands. But just as there are many different qualities of clay with different purposes, there's also many different qualities of men. Some men uh, live their lives and they're very useful for the potter. They're very useful for our father. Some men are are. are, are have very little value to the kingdom by the way they live their lives. And then some are really end up living their lives as a, a compute, completely useless, unworthy vessel for God. This also kind of reminds me of a, uh, of a parable in Matthew 15. And it's the... Uh, it's the, the parable of the sower and the seed. So I'm going to read Matthew, uh, sorry, 13, verses 1 through 9. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and a great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. The whole multitude soon stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. Some upon the stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. Some men fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirty. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, we're, we're actually we're, we're attempting a garden this year. Uh, and we've done gardens before. Uh, but this time we thought, you know, we're going to do a big garden. And to us, uh, it's, I think it's 20 by 50. And that's a big garden for us. Um, and, and it's amazing the different quality of soil within that 20 by 50 Point. And it's one thing that we've, we've pointed out multiple times. On one, we can have the same plant planted on one side of the garden, and it's flourishing. And then on the other side, it just, it just barely comes up. And there's that different quality of soil, soil even within that space. We, we grew some sunflowers for fun, let the kids plant them. There's some that are over my head, and then there's some that didn't get three inches before they withered. All in the same soil, getting the same water, getting the same fertilizer that I'm putting out. Yet there's different qualities of soil. Luke 8, 11 tells us that the seed is the word of God. And so in, in that parable, some fell on the wayside and, and it just didn't come up. And really this represents someone who, that they hear the word, they, they get the seed, 
But before it really sinks in at all, uh, Satan's there to grab it away from them. So they, they never really have, have uh, spent the time or, or have a good opportunity to let it even sneak, uh, sink in before they allow Satan to grab it. And then some fell on the, the thorny ground, and again, it came up, but it was choked. It was choked out by those, those thorns. I'll tell you, I'm not good at weeding. Uh, I love the garden. Uh, I think I bit off more than I could chew this time. Uh, we are getting some plants, but the weeds are flourishing right now. Um, and I've tried to bribe the kids, uh, and it works every now and then, but then it, it's getting hot. And uh, it's, it's not as worth it to them. But the, those thorns choke out the, uh, the word. And these are the people that they hear the word and, and they respond to it. They obey it. They're excited about it. But those thorns of life come in. Those things get to them. The, the troubles come in. The, the heat gets too hot. There's things with work. There's things with family. There's maybe school things that get to them, and, and they, they put that on a back burner. They put God on it until the word is completely choked out of their lives. And then there's the stony ground. I'm sorry. Uh, the stony ground is the one that, uh, that came up and didn't take root. So their roots weren't deep enough that when those, when those trials of life came, uh, they, they weren't grounded enough in the word that uh, it, it didn't take root so the sun was able to scorch them but there's also seeds that fell on good ground and that's the one that produced fruit and the interesting thing is what what's inside fruit it's more seed right more seed that can be spread and continue that cycle it's interesting to notice that that seeds that fell even on the good ground the parable describes them as producing differently. So you have a hundredfold, 60, and 30. So you can have that good soil, that good that, that that seed gets in, and you can have different results that are all positive. Obviously, we, we, we celebrate the, the plant that can produce a hundredfold more than the 30, but the 30 is still, is still great and appreciated, right? The parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30 uh, also shows us different qualities of people. One man, as you all know, had the five talents. One had two, and then there was one, and, and each one of them produced differently. The one with two didn't, didn't produce five. So each one of them, so that, there's a different quality of soil, of talent, of clay. The success of the, the soil, the, the clay, the talents, the success of us uh, for God largely depends on how, how willing we are to submit to the will of God. If we're not willing to submit, we may, we may be willing right at first. We're excited. We, we see all the benefits here. We're, we're oh, wow, I, I just love being here. These people are so nice to me. And we're, we're pumped. And then things start hitting us in life. And and we kind of back away and forget about what got us so excited. Our success in life, true success in life, is going to be determined by how willing we are to submit to God's word. <clears throat> now, life's proving ground, the baking oven, it, it hardens the clay or it shows it to be unworthy. And the, the baking oven, in the, the illustration that we talked about earlier, would represent those challenges, those pressures. Uh, as, as hardships and sadness and, and temptations uh, hit us and, and continue to hit us, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to either test us and make us stronger and help us help others, and make it easier to resist more temptations as they come. Or they're going to break us. They're going to cause us to shatter under the pressure. They're going to cause us to, to become unusable for Christ. Have you ever 
Ever seen someone that uh, that you know has had a had a had a tough life? And and I think of uh, uh, of some preachers I've heard that have talked about talked about the, the the rough past that they've had, and then how how wonderful of a preacher they are now. And not that they're talking about how wonderful they are, but but you know how wonderful they are, and, and you you see the impact they're having through their lives, and and. And then you have the people on the other hand that face those same trials. But instead of turning to God, they turn to the world. They turn to, they turn to, to trying to get rich quick to get out of it. They turn to drugs to try to escape it. They turn to a number of, of worldly sins to try to distract themselves from these troubles. And sometimes you can just see it in them. You can see it by the way... Uh, they walk, they talk. You, you can see them physically ruined by this life. And they physically look broken at times. Sometimes we might even say, you know, that person's us. We might say that person's beyond repair. All right, now let's focus our attention on the display room where the, where the pottery is shown off. Uh, it, it shows the, the finished products and in, in, when we're putting this in perspective for us, it's the, it's the finished products of our lives. The best thing that a pottery, that, that pottery can do for a potter is to bring honor to that potter so that somebody comes and buys it, right? So that people, so that people want it, so that people want to see it. The best thing that we can do in our lives is bring glory and honor to our potter. To our God. Matthew 5, 16 says, So even let your light shine before men, that others seeing your good works may glorify your Father who is in heaven. There's something different about a Christian in there. I shine a little different, not physically, but in the midst of all the turmoil, those that are truly convicted and willing to submit to God, they stand out, don't they? 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So Paul describes two types of vessels here. The vessel of honor, the vessel of dishonor. Let's look at a, a couple of examples, or a few examples of, of vessels, people that brought honor or dishonor. I think of the, the nation of Israel. Uh, the, the nation of Israel was tried in some fires, weren't they? Uh, they, they? They faced multiple challenges that tested their character. Once they'd been set free from, from their bondage in Egypt, we see that time and time again they failed, didn't they? They failed to bring honor. And, and many of them, especially those that, that originally left Egypt, really paid for it. They didn't get to go to the promised land. Most of them. Very few exceptions there. Multiple chances to prove themselves. I think of Samson. Uh, a man with such potential. Uh, he's almost like the, uh, the anti-Goliath, right? He strikes fears into those that oppose God. And uh, such enormous physical strength, but such moral weakness. And the, the position he got himself into, you think of him with his, his eyes gouged out as a spectacle, was not bringing honor to God. Saul, first king of Israel, good example of some marred clay. Uh, he began his reign uh, great, you know, if, uh, and had potential to, to really reign wonderfully. Um, but his pride and his stubbornness, uh, his self-will really hurt his ability to, to lead God's people and, and uh, really ended up turning him into a, a broken vessel. He, he ended up taking his own life at Mount, Mount Gilboa. Because he had gotten to him, himself, again, such great potential for God, and it brought himself to such a point that, that he was broken. 
Even King Solomon uh, could be viewed as a, as a vessel of dishonor. Uh, another man that just had amazing potential. Uh, we'll, we'll, you can read in Second Chronicles nine twenty two that uh, that King Solomon's riches exceeded all the kings of the earth and his wisdom. Uh, some scholars estimate that his yearly income was probably about one point two four billion dollars. If you try to transfer that into uh, today's numbers and. And you know, I like to think that if I had $1.24 billion, think of, think of what you could do for Christ. And I, I like to think that way, but that's not often what we see, is it? Solomon had great potential, but, but even with his great wisdom and power, he allowed himself to be carried away into idolatry. And When he, he, uh, when he inherited the kingdom from, from King David, the kingdom was very strong. So, so with that good base he had, plus the wisdom and, and mon monetary power that he had, he could have really taken things off for Christ. But we know that at the end of his life, he realized that he'd spent his life in vain. <clears throat> he ended up leaving it to his, uh, his son Rehoboam, and it was so weak when he handed it off, not like when his dad gave it to him, so weak that it ended up breaking up into two different nations, not even being united. And there's more examples of dishonor, but I don't want to continue to focus on those. I want us to think about some vessels of honor, because that's what we should really strive to be. I think about Joseph and how he remained a vessel of honor through everything that he went through throughout his life. Uh, talk about somebody tried in fire. About the age 17, he was sold by his brothers into slavery can't imagine. I mean, I can't imagine my brother uh, treating me bad. Uh, we're great friends now, but uh, when I was 17, it might not have been the case. But, but not that bad, right? So I think of uh, how hard that must have been. But he didn't falter. Falsely accused, imprisoned, persecuted, misunderstood, neglected. And all these things, and all these things that kept hitting him. It's amazing how Joseph maintained his integrity and his honesty and his moral purity when it would have been very easy to compromise in any one of those things. The fires of life, I, I believe, made Joseph into a much stronger leader, and it definitely gave him better potential to do good for the Lord. I think about Daniel, who showed that, that he was made with good clay throughout his life, uh, Daniel withstood many tests. There were plots against Daniel, including a lion's den. <laughs> but from his youth and, and really until his death, he, he kept showing that good quality clay that he was determined to be. There's many New Testament characters that showed themselves to be made of good clay. I, I think of John the Baptist. I, I think of the apostles, obviously with the exception of Judas. Judas is an example who had, had good potential, but but didn't follow through with it. Peter, James, John, Paul, they didn't have an easy life. But those fires of life allowed them to be tested and show themselves good clay. Also don't ignore the women, uh, Ruth and Esther, Naomi, Lydia, amazing examples of good clay when faced with trouble. And through all these examples, there's one thing that they all had in common. And that was that they were all willing to submit to God's will, no matter what the cost was going to be. And there was some cost, quite a few of them. But no matter what the cost was going to be, they were going to submit to God's will. But brethren, we're not exempt from this. Uh, we are the clay. We read that in the Bible. Our quality... And our worth for the kingdom is determined by our willingness to obey God. By our willingness to submit to his word. By our willingness to be molded into what God wants us to be. A servant of his. Many people try to, to outwardly appear to be made of good clay. 
Uh, they've got friends and family, and, and they want to they try to remain that image without, without fully committing their, themselves to God. And, but then we see the fires of life come, and the fires reveal what imperfections are there. The fires will, again, either make them stronger or cause them to shatter and break. Sometimes we sing a song, Have Thine Own Way, and, and you know, when we sing these words, uh, do we really commit to what they're saying? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I'm waiting, yielded and still. Is that really our attitude? Do we really, as we read the word, do we really say, I want to be everything that this commands me to be, no matter what? The cost. We know from the parable of the, the talents mentioned earlier that, that God rewards those that bring honor. But on the flip side, we also read from the man that had one that did nothing with it, that, that showed really to be a dishonor, that he punishes those that don't bring honor. And so this morning, I, I challenge you if if you're not living your life as that good clay, if you're not showing yourself worthy in the fires, there will come a day where that clay will, will be revealed as to what it is truly made of. And the vessels of honor will spend eternity with the Lord. And the vessels of dishonor will be broken for everlasting punishment. If you know that, that you're not bringing honor to the Lord the way you need to, if you know that you need to be refined more because of things that, that you've done, whether, whether publicly and you need to, to confess that in front of this group, or if you just need the prayers of the church because it's something you're dealing with, or if you've never put, in, put on Christ in baptism, you can't show honor. You need to do so, and, and we plead with you to do that as we stand and as we sing. opportunity for us to be able to give back as we have prospered, Father, this week. 
praying, our Lord, that these funds will be used to further the work within the church and also, Father, to help the needy saints. Father, we are so thankful, our Lord, for jobs and uh, the ability to, to help, Father, to support the needs of the saints, Father, through your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We want to thank Brother John for the lesson that he has brought us, and we want to thank him for filling in for Mark in this time. And uh, we would gladly have him back any time he wants to come down and visit with us. And, uh, let's continue to remember all those who are upon our sick list, uh, and you know, those recovering from surgeries. You know, as we said, Mark is having a, a rough morning this morning. We pray for his continued recovery. Uh, Sherry's still recovering from her shoulder surgery. She seems to be doing pretty good with it. And that, well, we hope that that all continues well with her. And that. Uh, I don't know how long will Eric and Haley be down. Will y'all be headed home today? We want to pray y'all have a safe journey home. And that, and you know, y'all can come back anytime you want. You don't have to worry about mom and dad, you know, we, you know. <laughs> and that's, you know, but uh, we, it is great to see y'all. It's good to see each and every one of you that are here this morning and that everything. And that and let's continue to pray that uh, these things will pass and that we will be able to take these masks off and, and we can shake hands and 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 give the brothers and sisters hugs and that and everything again one day because as Scott and I discussed one day, it don't feel right, you know, not being able to shake or, or hug a brother or sister. You know, and that it just there's something wrong with that. You know, so let's hope and pray that that will soon pass and that and everything. Uh, again, as I said earlier, next Sunday hopefully will be our last Sunday where we will only have the one-hour service, and hopefully the following Sunday we will start having full services again. Remember, when we do start having full services, we will start back in the uh, lesson of Hebrews where we left off and if I remember right we will be with lesson number three we will do them lessons on Sunday morning and Wednesday evening until we get that caught up then when Mark takes over the next class he will do Sunday mornings and Wednesday evening until we get caught up with that one and that and everything so and the new books are here on the front pew and that if you haven't picked you up one as of yet so no other announcements at this time, so if we please stand, we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> most gracious and heavenly Father, as we again approach thy most gracious and righteous throne, Father, we give all honor and glory to thy most precious and holy name. Thanking you, Father, for this day that you have given us to come together for the study of thy word, for the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ, Father, that we are able to sing praises unto thy most righteous name and that we are able to partake of the table of remembrance of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you go with each and every one of us as we are about to part this place of worship. We pray that each and every one of us have a safe journey home. We pray for those who are having to be uh, traveling far distances, Father, that you be with them, guide them.